Hello there, my name is Brent, and today we are going mining. We are searching for gold. I am up here in Washington at my friend Jason's mine. We're gonna learn all about gold underground mining and hopefully find some gold. Another thing I was able to do this month that I think just gave me a huge appreciation for everything that happened here in the past was to go underground hard rock mining. And this time, instead of looking for silver, I was looking for gold. <laughs> My friend Jason has a mine up in Washington, and so he invited me up to get the wood you see behind me, but also to go gold mining in this mine that he's recently opened up. I ended up with this, 10 grams of pure gold, the process of which is not very easy, but one that I now just appreciate so much more after the time up there. Jason owns Mount Baker Mining up in Washington, and we met a couple years ago because I was trying to refine the ore here at Cerro Gordo, the Galena, which is lead and silver, all the way down to silver. You know, so I was looking around online for anybody that would know how to do this, and Jason seemed like the guy. You know, so a couple years ago, we refined 100 pounds of ore out of the Union Mine here, made it into some silver, and became pretty good friends in the process. And a couple months ago, he was like, listen, you know, if you want to make your way up to Washington, I'd love to take you into this gold mine that I'm reopening from the 1890s. And to me, the idea of reopening a mine to actually mine it again is very interesting. You know, I think I'm always trying to understand the history here. I think part of that is putting myself in the places that these miners used to be, so meaning the Union Mine, but also trying to understand what life would have been like for them, you know? And so Jason offered me to bring me underground, you know, we were going to go mucking, we were going to refine some of the ore and just get a better sense of underground mining. So I made my way up to Bellingham, Washington, which is Jason's hometown. And from there, it's about two hours to his mine. The mine's out by Mount Baker, which his equipment shop is named after. And Jason just has an amazing connection to it. This mine was originally opened in the 1890s. They pulled many millions of dollars out of it. And then back in the 90s and the early 2000s, it was being worked again, and Jason actually worked there. You know, this is his first place that he went up, he worked, he learned the skills of being a miner, you know, drilling, blasting, mucking, refining, and it kind of set him on his path to opening Mount Baker Mining, which, you know, is his whole job now. So it's really cool on the drive out just to hear him recounting how he came into mining, how he came into this mine, and just the importance of it to him. You know, I think this adds so much context to something when you understand why somebody's doing something. And I fully get why Jason's trying to reopen this mine, you know, what he's trying to do. And that passion is just super cool. Eventually you get to the place where there's three little portals that show Jason's mine. And I was stoked, you know, I was very excited to go in, learn about it, and just experience a little bit of what underground mining would be like. Because I think that any time you understand something better, you like it a little bit more. Hi, my name's Harry from Mine Operator. I'm up here working with Jason from Mount Baker Mining and Metals, and we're up here showing these guys around. Yeah, let's go check it out today. We're gonna find some gold for Brent. But this is our old gold mine. It started up about 1900, right about the turn of the last century. Most of this work was done by hand. That's why it's so low, so watch your head. And they came in here about 75 feet. And then right at this intersection, we get our first look at the quartz vein. So this right here is the, the quartz vein. That's what carries the gold. So there's the hanging wall here, and the foot wall is down here, and the hanging wall and foot wall don't have any gold at all. There's no value there. It's strictly in the quartz vein. And so it's really, really easy to tell if you're an ore because the quartz white and the country rock here is black. So black rock is bad, white quartz is good. But we'll follow this quartz vein along for about 500 feet. And down in this section of the mine, there wasn't a lot of gold they took out. The quartz vein isn't very rich down here, but at the end of this 
at it, we'll climb a raised ladder of about 50 feet, and we'll get into the stope. And that's where they did the majority of their mining and got most of their gold. This mine produced somewhere between five and 10,000 ounces of gold over 20, 15 or 20 years from 1900 to about 1925. And so Jason and Harry's main goal this year was just to rehab the mine. You know, get new timbering in place, get some of the ore shoots in place, do a little bit of mucking, you know, get the process down of how they're gonna extract ore so next year they can have a big season. There are several places along this, this drift, this lower haulage way, where they did exploratory races up on the vein. Even if this vein did have gold in it, it's just too narrow right here to actually do mining on. It's just, it's just not economically feasible to mine a six or eight inch wide quartz vein unless it has 10 ounces a ton because you have to, just to get a person in there to mine it, you have to take two or three feet, so you're diluting the quartz vein. One of the things that we've had to do for safety is some of these races I was talking about earlier, they go up a long way. And so just to keep the mine safe, and we don't wanna have a bunch of big open holes over our head, we've had to timber off some of these big raises. It takes a lot of wood to go mining. I found that out. I, I was, amazed at how much wood we've put in into this mine, but you just use it for everything. Ladders, lagging, stalls, support. We use, we've used a lot of wood. This is a spot where they mined down the vein, and that's called the winds, when they mine down. And because the mine's so wet, it's filled up with water. But this is kind of a unique place in the, in the whole mining district because this is the only place anywhere in the district where someone died. And it ended up being a murder. The story is, is there was, they left two guys over the winter to protect the mine from vandals or claim jumpers or whatever. And the deal was that they could take as much gold as they wanted or as they could find to stay over winter and protect the mine. And when they came back in in the spring, they only found one guy. He had a bunch of gold. And he said the other guy had gone out hunting a week or two ago and never came back. So they sent out a search party, looked for him. They never did find him. So they thought, well, we'll come back and start mining. When they were pumping out this winds, they found that guy's body at the bottom of the winds with a big rock tied around his neck. And the other guy with all the gold had taken off and was long gone. So that's the only death ever recorded in the mining district got murdered, and this was his burial site. I was in here years and years ago, and we were screwing around down there trying to get some gold off the floor, and it was raining really hard outside, and the water was running down here, and we were probably 200 feet down the tunnel, and I swear to you, it sounded like two people were back here talking. And you could almost hear exactly, you could almost hear the words yeah. they were saying, but it was just the water falling at the certain rate or pitch yeah. or whatever, I don't know what the word is, but it was the weirdest I've ever felt underground. Cause yeah. it was like, there's someone back there. Yeah. Like we're not the only ones in the mine. Yeah. But it was, it was very, very weird. So we had to build this sucker and it was a chore. <laughs> and it took a lot of wood. It took us, uh, Harry, you remember four days? Four or five days. A total work, oh yeah. Yeah, it took us to build this. And we ran out of wood, so I had to go cut down some more trees and build up some more wood, but we finally got it. The ladder goes up about 50 feet. I think there's 53 steps, and they're, they're 12 inches apart. So there's a ladder on one side, there's a chute on the other, and then a, kind of a little wall rail in between. Yeah, this was a real, a real engineering feat here because there's nothing square, there's nothing, yeah. no no standard distance or anything. We were just wedging stalls in and then lagging ladders to them. Going up and around the corner. Yeah, quite pretty difficult. It's, it's very difficult, yeah. Did they have ladders here before they just rotted it away? They had ladders here and we pulled some out. We used the chute on our left to slide sandbags down. That's how we get our ore out. Right. That's how you're gonna get my ore out today. Yep. And this section, it's just, it's not steep enough to be good for a ladder. Yeah. Or it's steep enough that you need a ladder in it. Yeah. So it's, it's a difficult section, but. Yeah, it's a little awkward. So come on up. 
Now we're in the transfer way. Nice. So the only reason this little section is here is to get ore from the stove to the rails. Okay. There's no ore in here, there's nothing. It was just to make it easier to move the muck around. So this is your first look at the stove. So you just listen to the rock. That's real solid. And sometimes they sound real drummy and then it takes forever to skin them. So if this one doesn't come right off, I'll just let Harry deal with it after we go past it. But that's what you do, you just walk along the drift and you listen for the sound. This is probably the slipperiest spot. Okay. So watch your footing here. And the back is real low, so you're gonna get a little muddy probably. So this is a little bit unusual. I haven't been in a lot of mines with big open stopes like this, where they've left pillars to hold up the back. It's not a terribly uncommon method, but you just don't see it very much because a lot of times they won't stay supported for a hundred years. So they end up caving in. But the rock here is so good and so strong and so solidified that you can have these big spans between these pillars and you still have the, the back that holds up together. We've quarantined it off or gated it off so you can't just go wandering off and get hit in the head with a rock. This rail has been here since they quit in 26. And this is the real stuff. This is the real yeah. iron rail sleepers. And they would run ore carts back and forth all day long. They used to run the ore cart down. It would dump into the transfer way over the rays, dump into the rays, and then out the way that we came in. There were a few spots where they had set old timbers, like right here on your left. So this is one of their old stalls. And rather than us screw with it, we just set a couple on either side. But you can see, you know, compared to your wood in your mine, this has been here a oh, hundred years. Pretty wet. And I can push my finger into it, whereas your stuff looks like it was milled two That's days ago. Day. Yeah. But all mines have big timbers. You have some stuff that looks Ooh. like this. Yep. Just big, big pieces of wood to hold up the world. Every piece of rock that went out of this mine was hand mucked into ore carts and then pushed down the rail and out to the mill. So it was a lot of work. I've never had as much appreciation for the old miners as I, as I have over the last week trying to hand muck that stuff into sandbags. Yeah. It is so repetitive and I like there's just no end. You feel like you're gonna muck forever and you're never you're never going anywhere. That's what we're doing today. That's what we're doing today. That's why <laughs> that's why you're here. And this stuff here on the right is the bigger chunks of ore that we've picked out of our muck pile. You get an idea of what the gold ore looks like. And I'll explain a little bit more about this when we get over to the face. So this ore has had two different generations of quartz. There's a rusty quartz that has bigger crystals and that doesn't carry any gold. But then you have this bright white quartz here on top that has these sulfides running through it. And that is where all the gold in our vein is. And in some sections, you'll have a seven foot wide vein and there's only a little area where that, that gold bearing quartz is, but it's really, really rich. You can slab this stuff up and the sulfides come through and if there's gold in it, it really shows up really, really nice. So this is... Is that gold there then in the black? That is not gold. All right. That, yeah, that is an iron sulfide yes. called pyrotite. And it's kind of like pyrite's cousin. It has, it's iron and sulfur, but it's in a little bit different mix than, than a pyrite cube has. But yeah, that's, in this mine, this is a really good indicator that we have gold in this rock. But I'll show you some gold. My, what I say to people is, if you think it's gold, it's not. When you see gold, it's like, that is gold for sure. You, there's no mistake in it. All right. So this is our working face here behind me. And we're in this big open room and the vein outcrops all the way around. And the miners left this, not because it was didn't have any gold in it, but they left it because 
they built two or three different mills outside to mill the ore and get the gold out. But because we have such high snow loads in the winter here, their mill kept getting wiped out by avalanches year after year. And after the third mill, they gave up and they went away. So the mine had closed down and there's, there were some spots back here that were running two and three and four ounces a ton. And hopefully today we can find some spots. There's a narrow section of the vein that I'm gonna show you that is unbelievably rich, like dozens of ounces a ton. But we did a blast along this wall a couple days ago. We've got a huge pile of muck. So after we're done picking and looking for gold, we're gonna do a little bit of muck and we're gonna work on getting some muck out to the truck. And if you're interested in seeing the blast, I've got a whole series of videos on me developing the mine, timbering the rays, doing the drilling and blasting, and now mucking. So check out my channel if you wanna see more. Okay, let's find some gold. Let's find some gold. Let's find some gold. Let's find some gold. If you look along the vein, there's that horizontal line running right through the vein, right there. Right underneath that horizontal line, there's that line of sulfides, that line of pyrotite. That is where the gold hangs out. Ooh. So as you can see, the vein's three feet thick here or something, there's a little bit of waste. But we're gonna pick right along in here. The line comes across back in the back of that hole and right up through here. So we're gonna just pick along the, the face here and hopefully we can find some gold. That's the thing, you don't wanna blast it all over the yeah. stope and lose it. So see all that shiny stuff there? Yeah. That is what you're looking for. Woo! It's not gold, but it's a good gold indicator. It's not like your mine where you knock it off and it's just Galena, Shiny, you know, yeah, hand, handball sized pieces of, of muck. Or can I find any gold in my gold mine, Eric? <laughs> I have something that might help you out. Oh, your, your microscope. Yes, sir. Oh, nice. I don't want any gold, I can see the microscope. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> this is how we live down south. Yeah. Can't see the gold with the naked eye, but we are. Yeah, there's a little piece of gold there. Oh, a little gold. piece of gold there. Little baby, baby pieces. Well, that's a start. Yeah. Let's see if it's got any bigger brothers or sisters. There we go, encapsulated in the quartz right there. Gold. Gold. We found it. We found it. <laughs> There's probably like 800 ma magnification. Yeah. It's right at the tip of my yeah. finger right there. You can see it kind of glimmer. It. Yeah. That's good. I know this guy that's got this mill and a shaker table that will get this no problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know a guy? You know a guy. Look at that piece. Dang, that is awesome. Isn't that cool? Now I get what you say, you know, when you see gold. So we don't really have this part perfected yet. <laughs> oh, just so it goes on the slide? But the idea is, yeah, you unload the chute, or the cart, you come over here, and they go down and make a pile at the nice. next transfer station. We're mining now! We're mining! <laughs> so after we went mining and we chipped out some gold, it was time to muck. And mucking, in this case, is to take the loose rock, you know, that's in front of the face that you're mining, and to remove it. Maybe to refine it, maybe just to discard it. In this case, we're gonna refine it. And I knew that mucking was pretty low on the totem pole of mining jobs, and I can kind of understand why now. You basically hunch over, you fill up a bag full of rocks. Jason and Harriet constructed this cart that sits on old rails. You put the bag under the cart, you push it over, you then send it down some chutes, and it takes just a very long time after you actually chip out the gold to get it out of the mine. It might seem really basic, but I think while doing that, everything started to clip. You know, the mine tracks that I see, the ore shoots, it's all an attempt to get this relatively heavy material out this hunched over crazy like tunnel the whole way. And so it was kind of fun to pack up the bag, put it onto the cart, push the cart over, you know, throw an ore bag down an ore chute, see how Jason had constructed his, all in the attempts just to get these rocks out of the mine. <laughs> and finally we did, you know, we took about, I think five or six bags out of the mine. We need the gym. Nicely done. We need, we need track. Yeah. 
There you go. Yep. All right. So that's mining. That's mining. That's how you do it. That's, <laughs> in a nutshell, that's mining. Absolutely. So with these five bags, how much gold do you, would you anticipate being in these five bags? The ore on average is about a dollar a pound. And, and our bags are anywhere between 30 and 40 pounds. So we could have 150 to 200 dollars. Yeah. Nice. Something like that in those bags. And that's like, uh, is that like 10 grams? I don't know the... Uh, yeah, so $200 is about a tenth of an ounce. Okay. So it's about three three grams. Yeah, nice. Yeah, roughly. And we have, I don't know, like I mentioned earlier, we have 140 bags. Right. So I don't know what the math is, but right. it's like, you know, that's Sweet. a couple tons, I think. So maybe there's, on a good day, $5,000 sitting there yeah. in the... So an ounce and a half or something like that, or? Uh, yeah, two, two and a half two ounces. Two and a half ounces, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if we have two and a half tons, now I got to get it down and run through the crusher and on right. the shaker table and smelt it. And right. So at the end of the season, my goal is to pour a 10 ounce bar. Wow. That's what I want. I sweet. want a 10 ounce gold bar at the mm -hmm. end of the season. Well, it yeah. seems hard even today, so I can't imagine how hard it was when they were up here in the 1800s. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everything was by hand. They didn't have sandbags. I don't know if they had buckets even. Yeah. They were just shoveling from one guy to the next into the ore cart, and it was... The ore cart came down the track and it dumped, and then someone had to shovel it into another ore cart, and then yeah. down and dumped. There was probably somewhere between 30 and 50 guys working okay. this mine when it was mm -hmm. like really going. So it's it's hard to have three of us come up here and like make it. It's a lot of work. Right, it's totally. just It's just a lot of work. The air drill that we use mm -hmm. is more or less the same technology they had back then, mm -hmm. and we're doing everything by hand. So we're really doing everything the way they did it. So we got all the ore back to Jason's shop and I remember it was getting pretty late, you know, it'd been a long day mining and we we're all a little bit tired, but then it was really cool. You know, then I got to learn about the process of refining the gold itself. Now we're down at Mount Baker Mining and Metals kind of demo system here. And we run a lot of samples for people through this equipment to kind of show them how the equipment works, test out their samples, that kind of thing. We've brought four or five bags down from the mine that Brent and I mucked yesterday. And now we're going to run them and see how much gold we have. It all starts here with this jaw crusher. It's going to take the rocks that we took out of the mine crush them up and it's going to turn the rocks into gravel. The next step is we're going to take those buckets. We're going to bring them up here to our hair mill. And as I dump the stuff in here, it's going to break all that stuff up into really fine sand. It's going to liberate all the gold from the quartz. We're going to run some water down through it so it keeps the dust down and makes a really nice slurry. So it comes down onto our third piece of equipment here. And the gold, as it comes across, it's much more dense than everything else. So it settles down in these grooves. And as the table shakes, it bounces the gold across the table here. The gold and the other heavy minerals will work their way down the cross the shaker table into the number one and the number two concentrates. And that will be all the values from our ore concentrated down in just a small amount of stuff. So then we can get the gold out a lot easier. So let's get this stuff fired up. We'll see if we have any gold. Well, we've worked our gold down into our number one and number two concentrates here. And out of those five sacks, we got it down into that much concentrates. Weighs less than a pound. We probably started with about 200 to 250 pounds. Yeah. So all of our gold is now concentrated in here. And now the real work of getting it out is the smelting and the refining process. But now let's go get Brent's gold refined and we'll send him back with a little button. All right, sun has set. And we are going to take that gold you saw come out of the wall of Jason's mine and we're going to get it down to just the gold. That's the plan. Back where we refined a bunch of silver a couple years ago now. Time to make some gold. This is a little four inch by six inch, just a baby little jaw crusher. So it's just like the bigger one, just a smaller version. So it's going to do the same thing. We're going to crush our big rocks down to small size. And once they're crushed, we're gonna run them through a little bit different pulverizer, crush them down. The whole idea is the same. We're trying to liberate the gold from all the quartz and all the sulfides, and then we can refine it down to that pure gold button. So we're gonna start with 16 pounds. 
Let's see how much gold we get out of it. Yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be cool. We're gonna move to our second step now. This is kind of like a little grain mill. This is gonna take the stuff out of the jaw crusher, crush it up and into a fine sand. There's two discs. One is, one is stationary here and the material comes out the middle. And then they just come real close together. This one turns. Hmm. And so the stuff goes through the middle and when it gets ground fine enough to come out that little slot, Falls out the bottom. Come, come feel this. Yeah. Feel how fine it gets. A lot of like powder almost. Yeah, it's like very, very fine rock dust. Yeah. So now the idea is that all the gold particles are broken apart from the quartz, and now we can pan them out. It seems to me that no matter how big of a gold mining operation it is, I mean, huge, huge gold mining operations, a lot of times it still comes down to panning at the end. <laughs> So here we are, we're gonna just get out the pan and we're gonna pan this stuff down. And I'll show you how to refine it from there. The gold is very, very dense compared to the quartz and the other sulfides. So as I shake it and get it wet, the gold is gonna go right down to the bottom of the pan. And I can wash off the light quartz into this catch basin. I'm not gonna throw anything away. And actually maybe on a future video, I will re-refine my tailings and see how much gold I lost. But right now, we're gonna get this gold out of all this fl rock flour, and then we can get it refined down to a bead so Brent can take it home. You know, and I have seen gold panning, obviously in movies, TV shows, all sorts of things for years. I thought it was just swirling around. And I can see again why gold is so valuable. You know, people spend an entire day sitting by the riverbed, just panning all day, just to get tiny flecks, and tiny flecks, and tiny flecks. At the very end, you know, you bring up the pan and you see kind of almost this like half rainbow of gold. Well, here's our, here's our first pan. This was, I don't know, a couple handfuls. And there you can see the gold in it. Gold. Very, very fine. So there's not, it's not a bunch of nuggets. It's very small, small gold. But when there's a bunch of it, it really adds up. Yeah. Everything yellow in there is gold. Then you take what I believe is called a snuffer bottle, and a snuffer bottle basically just like sucks up all of the gold from the bottom of the pan. So I've got our gold sucked up in our snuffer bottle here. And I can just kind of leak it out into our blue towel here. And it acts kind of like a coffee filter. So there's some nice gold there. There's a lot of gold in there. Yeah. Stuff you mind. Nice work. That's good. You picked a good spot. <laughs> you picked a good spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we found a good spot. <laughs> there you go. This is bismuth. Okay. And uh, it's like lead's brother. We're going to yep. put a little bit of bismuth in with our gold. It's going to alloy with the gold, just okay. like with lead. Then we're going to put it in our furnace, and the bismuth is going to oxidize, be absorbed into the cupel, just yep. like lead with silver at Cerro Gordo. Right. The gold will be left in the cupel after Sweet. all our bismuth is gone. And so this whole process is gonna remove all the base metals. So any copper that's in there, any iron that's in there, bismuth, lead, all that is gonna go away. There's our bismuth at the very bottom, right on top of our gold. Mm -hmm. So now I can take our rag. All our gold and goodies are down at the bottom here. Squeeze out the last little bit of water and then take my overkill scissors here off the excess. This is what I call my my gold packet. Oh yeah, gold <laughs> my packet. Gold, gold blob here. Now let's go put it in our furnace. All right. This is our cupelling furnace. I run it about 1850 degrees Fahrenheit. So once that melts off and the bismuth starts to melt, you'll see a silver liquid pool in the cupel. And that's the bismuth melting alloying with all the gold, and then the bismuth will oxidize away. Yeah. You can see it's kind of the back yeah. there. Any parting words, Jason, after a 
couple days of mining. Yeah, it was a great trip. I really appreciate you coming up. I know it's a long trip for you, but I'm really glad we could get some gold at the end. And I'm very, very excited to see what you do with it. Thank you. Yeah. After all of that, I ended up with this, a 10 gram bead of pure gold. All right, so the time in Washington has come to a close. It's time to get this truck with all the wood and this gold back to Cerro Gordo. It's gonna be a long trek, but we got some precious cargo and some precious gold. You know, I think it was something like four or $5,000 a ton, and it was just an amazing haul. This little bead, you know, as small as you can see, is worth something like six or $700 worth of gold in this tiny, tiny, little thing that you see in front of you, uh, which is incredible to think about. And now I have to think about what I'm gonna do with it. Uh, if you guys have any ideas, I would love to hear because this is pure gold from Jason's mine that I helped mine that is now back here at Cerro Gordo. If you guys have any ideas, let me know below. But I also just wanna say a huge thank you to Jason. You know, he was extremely generous with his time, with his gold. You know, I don't think that I'll walk through the tunnels again and not look at the timbering and think that was a huge pain to create. And so it was a really cool experience. And I'm just really excited that I got to know Jason all these years ago and that we continue to figure out things to do in the years to come. Thank you.